Um, once we learned about our duties, we got into responsibility, which was last week. We, uh, we, we uh, talked about what responsibility was, which is basically you feel ob obliged to answer for something or to be accountable to someone. Uh, we said that all responsibilities that we undertake, um, even if they're not religious, they have to be honored so long as they do not betray our obligations uh, and moral law in Islam. We also said that you are ultimately responsible for yourself, so you cannot pass on responsibility to anybody else. This includes any superiors or your parents or absolutely anybody who might be commanding you to do something that is immoral. Ultimately, you are responsible for yourself, and so this is why this course is incredibly important. Responsibility is personal. No blame or praise can be reassigned to anyone. Okay, so we also said something very important in responsibility, which is that no one can, um, no one will have to account for his actions uh, before having been informed of the rules first. As a matter of fact, the law has to have been made available. One has to be in the correct state to receive it, and it must have been brought to one's personal attention. Okay, so there are conditions for responsibility, but once those are all in place, you're fully responsible. Now, today we're going to talk about sanction, and of all uh, the elements of the moral law in the Quran, to me, sanction is probably the most challenging, uh, both in explaining it and in understanding it, for a number of reasons. And I think primarily because so much happens in our world, the world that we live in, where we don't see a consequence that our moral self would tell us is just dessert. So we see a lot of nasty people getting a lot of good things and a lot of people doing a lot of good who aren't necessarily um, receiving benefit or who are suffering. And so sanction is a really interesting um, dimension of moral law in the Quran and of our understanding as Muslims. And it's very important to give us patience. So today we're going to look at what is moral sanction? What are the other kinds of sanction? Why does legal sanction in the Quran appear to be harsh sometimes, especially if we're talking about the uh, penal code? Why doesn't God intervene to change certain conditions? Why doesn't he reward or punish in this world in the way that we would expect? Um, and what can we expect in the world to come? And what is the role of our attitude? So what is moral sanction? Sanction is an approval or a penalty. And basically, it's the reaction of the law to our attitude, because we're talking about morality here. So the law starts, as we just mentioned, by appealing to our goodwill. It informs us of our duties. And then we have this moment where we decide, are we going to take on the obligation or are we not? And in our response of yes or no, in taking on that responsibility, the law responds and gives our attitude sanction. Now, what does that mean? It means that when I learn of a duty, I say to myself, yes, I will take this on, or no, I won't. If I say no, and it is a duty that is imposed on me by my faith, then the law will react to that. If I say yes, and I undertake it in a specific way, the law will also react to that. So moral sanction uh, entails the consequences that we benefit or suffer on account of how we undertake to perform our duties. But our satisfaction or our um, disappointment with ourselves is not sufficient. So I can feel remorse if I don't undertake a duty properly, or if I fall short, or I could feel satisfied. But this is really what the Quran tells us is that's the reaction of you to you. That's the reaction of your conscience to itself. It's not the reaction of the law to what you did. It's still an important reaction. And in the Quran, you know, we read when God says it, it means God swears by the soul that, um, that, that judges itself, that is, is constantly uh, checking itself. 
So this is a very important starting point that we feel this remorse or this satisfaction, but remorse in this case, because that inner reproach is what forces us to look for internal equilibrium again. You know, we begin to question, why am I agitated? Why don't I feel right? And that's the beginning, that feeling of remorse, that feeling of regret is the beginning of change. Now, it might amount to nothing if you just stop at that. If you just buy yourself a chocolate bar and you make yourself feel good and, and you know, that's the end of it. And that's not what the law obviously prompts you to do. The law wants you, what moral law wants you to do is to develop a new attitude. So in place of the attitude that you violated. So this properly is called repentance. This is how you repent. So it's not enough to, be, to feel bad. It's not enough to try to make yourself feel good. But you have to develop a new attitude. You have to renew yourself. So the Quran states that in addition to returning to God, you have to mend your ways, or we have to mend our ways by doing good, doing it properly, and doing it consistently. Repentance, as most of you must know, demands three actions. First, you have to stop from doing the wrong immediately. Second, you have to make amends for the past, if you can. And third, you have to participate in a better future. Those are the three conditions of repentance. Those are the three conditions that ensure that you have, or you have tried to take your will, bring it back to its original sense of dignity. Obviously, repentance cannot be delayed because every moment in the, the sin actually constitutes a new error. And one cannot continue to do this till the end of one's life because that's a bit too risky. And the Prophet, of course, alhamdulillah, did say that we could repent throughout our lives. However, the key here is to understand that we don't know when our lives are going to end. And this is why repentance as soon as possible um, and continually is very important. Now, if the wrong that we have committed uh, is, is that we fell short of a duty or we didn't do a duty, then it must be fulfilled. The, the answer is, or the solution is, to go fulfill that duty um, and to do it properly. If the wrong committed resulted in a hurt or a damage, like we spoke in last class, somebody was asking about uh, al or, you know, um, speaking behind people's backs and, you know, how that can cause damage, then compensation is required if possible. And this diminishes the effect of the act. It does not remove uh, the actual act. The Quran states, good actions if face bad ones. And um, the other A is others having recognized their sins, they mi mixed good works with other bad ones. Maybe Allah will forgive them. Take alms from their wealth to purify and enrich them and pray for them. Surely your prayers are a relief to them. And of course, that was in reference to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. So reparations do have to be made if that is possible. There's also something very beautiful. There's a dua um, in the case of, as we spoke last week, what, what if you can't do this? Well, there's a beautiful dua that um, I learned in Hajj, which is that you ask God to make up for your shortcomings so that you don't have to face, inshallah, these reparations on the Day of Judgment. So, you know, do really... Um, intense dua with God, that if, if you have done something and you cannot make these reparations, very difficult, uh, then, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will finish it for you in the world. That you don't, you know, wait till that moment and then you have to face uh, whoever you wronged um, and, and, and give them of your good deeds, which is what the Prophet ﷺ told us would happen. So essentially, um, on the Day of Judgment, if you have wronged somebody, then you give them of your good deeds and God forbid, not you, but they will be take, taken from somebody's good deeds. And uh, if that is not enough, then the perpetrator will take from the bad deeds of the victim um, and make up that way. So inshallah, we finish any of our wrongdoings in the world while we are in it and we don't have to face any of that on the day of judgment, inshallah. The exceptions, of course, to reparations, one of them, obviously, all of you know, is that converts to Islam are exempt from all reparatory measures, as coming into Islam removes all sin. And the other is any relapse on the part of one who has repented doesn't diminish the initial act of repentance. Just repent again. But it doesn't mean that the original sin or the original wrongdoing is um, reinstituted. 
that if you have repented sincerely, then that event is done. So the critical point, obviously, is to continually renew one's efforts and not to lose heart or hope. Now, that was restitutive sanction. Restitutive sanction basically means that we restore something to its original um, uh, state or we improve it. Then there's retributive sanction, which is given or extracted, like a reward or punishment. And doing good uh, and abandoning evil, the Quran tells us, has a real impact on us. So it impacts our, not only our sensibilities, but also our higher faculties. Acts of virtue and vice, as again, most of you will know, add value. They increase us in value. Uh, sorry, increases, uh, increases us in value. And vice obviously has the opposite effect. Virtue has many benefits. We learn, obviously, from the Quran and Sunnah that prayer has a dual moral function, for instance, namely restraining obscenity uh, and misconduct, extending our spiritual communication with uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Charity purifies the soul and turns us away from excessive attachment to wealth and brings relief, and as we just saw, purifies our wealth. Fasting has an eliminatory role. As we discussed, fasting is very important, keeps us from evil, it protects us against the power of the senses, and it enables us to respect the law even further. It empowers our will and shows us that there is something within us that can overcome uh, even our, uh, our most uh, strongest urges. And then the constant practice of virtuous actions makes obviously a person sensible, courageous, and generous. Some of you may have experienced this. The more good that you do, the more courageous you find yourself um, throughout your life. And you'll say, I can't believe I just did that. Well, you did it because really you should believe it. If you've been practicing in these you know, smaller events, you'll find that you'll do things that will surprise yourself. Now, that is the case for moral sanction. The Quran also covers legal sanction. And legal sanction in the Quran refers to penalties that uh, obviously in the world in which we live and even back then are enforced by the courts and the criminal courts in particular. Two forms of legal sanction in the Quran are the hudud and the tazirat. Okay, so the hudud, all of you have heard of them. They're the uh, maximum penalty that the law allows for um, certain crimes. And these crimes are known and they're very limited in Islam. Now, there's a lot of, obviously there's been a lot of controversy about the Islamic penal code and the corporal punishments that are involved. And what we're being guided to, or what, you know, Sheikh Draz is telling us, is that they draw our attention to the importance of the objectives of the law in achieving social order and directing our sensibilities towards a higher moral order. So values like faithfulness in marriage, security of person and property, reputation and dignity, um, all of these things outweigh sympathy for the criminal. The exemplary nature of punishments, he tells us, and we know, render them minimally applicable. As a matter of fact, he states, and we know from history, that not a single case of adultery was actually tried because of um, the evidences that was brought forward. Um, the, the conditions for the proof of guilt are extremely stringent when it comes to the hadud, and they are without compromise. So if you do not have the right number of witnesses, if you have not witnessed a specific act yourself, uh, it does not come to the maximum penalties. It cannot. As a matter of fact, the Quran then turns the tables on the person who brought forth the accusation. If they don't have three other people with them, then they are uh, guilty of having brought forth something that the law will simply not address because Islam respects uh, people's privacy um, uh, and because obviously the they are uh, quite stringent um, measures. The Quran also has other things, like, for instance, um, again, respecting privacy, not allowing people to spy on other people, which eliminates a huge source of evidence for informers. It also encourages, encourages us as um, witnesses to overlook and be discreet, especially if the person is, is worthy of that. You know, this is not a constant occurrence and they're not boasting about their exploits and trying to um, like create fitna or trying to uh, seduce other people or encourage them to do the same.
So I think we can take this up a bit in the discussion, but I think there's the one point, more point I wanted to make was the fact that the publicness of a crime. So in Islam, when a crime has been brought to public attention, then it must be rectified in the public for the public's interest. So that is something we cannot neglect, and it is extremely interesting, whether or not we're talking about the hudud or the tazirat. The tazirat are the discretionary measures that require the judge to consider the circumstances, the victim, the crime itself, and then to um, recommend an appropriate sanction. Uh, but with the hadood, the idea is that if it does come to the public attention, then public morality is what is at stake. And this is not something that Muslims ought to um, shun or turn away from, um, at least in some of the manifestations that we can have in the times in which we live. Even if we cannot implement the hadood, there should at least be some kind of reprimand if we want to um, save future generations from certain behaviors. And we can talk about that, inshallah, when we get to the question period. Now, the final kind of sanction that um, the moral theory of the Qur'an covers is divine sanction. And divine retribution in the present, in the life in which we live, is a very limited portion of divine sanction. We have the material aspect which is reward in this life or how um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give us specific rizq if we, are, if we have taqwa. So whoever is heedful of Allah, he will give him an outlet and provide for him from where he had not contemplated. That is really only the clear, uh, direct ayah that has uh, a rizq in it or has um, a, a kind of material uh, response to our taqwa. And of course, the opposite is also true in terms of the material aspect. The ingrateful, ungrateful towards God uh, are, made, are made to taste deprivation. They're chastised for their exaggerated confidence in their powers and their oppressive behavior towards others. Then there is the civic element, and this has to do with uh, how the Quran tells us that those who stand for what Allah has taught them and suffer in the way of God, that he will uh, protect them, that he will protect them from their enemies, and that he, they will not suffer on account of their scheming, ultimately suffer on account of their scheming. It says he grants them victory and helps and elevates them. Allah has promised those among you who believe and work righteous deeds that he will surely make them successors in the land as he succeeded those before them and he will establish for them their religion that he approved for them and he will exchange their fear for security. So this is a consequence or this is a, a sanction in this world. The enemies in contrast obviously are destined to defeat and regret. Divine sanction also has an intellectual element to it. So this was the retributive, this is the intellectual. And in the intellectual side, uh, the appeal to us is that God will show us the path uh, if we strive in his way. He's going to guide our hearts, lead us out of darkness to the light. Uh, for those who are pious and observe uh, his commands, he'll give them the power to discern truth and falsehood. He'll grant them a guiding light. Uh, and again, the opposite. Uh, um, for those who uh, don't follow the path, they will be in darkness and ignominy and all of these things. So the reward for the, the intellectual side is you have all of these things, you have clarity in your life, um, and you have light. The spiritual side of divine sanction involves... Um, the effective part, like it's, it's an emotional thing. It's what we sense. And here um, the Quran tells us that Allah loves those who do good, those who are just, those who are patient, those who are pious, uh, those who put their trust in him, those who fight in his way. And it is quite the long list, those who follow his will and profess gratitude to him. He will reinforce them or he, he reinforces them with a spirit from him. He is with those who keep themselves from wrongdoing and practice charity. He is their patron. So again, these are all effective. They affect the heart. This is the reward for those who um, respect uh, uh, moral law and undertake their duties. And again, the opposite is true for the ingrateful. Now, there is... 
as I said, most of divine sanction is in the world to come. It is not in this world. And this responds to some of the concerns that people have of, okay, why do we see, you know, bad people living good lives and, and good people living really tough lives? And here's the answer. I mean, in, in this world, uh, most of what we do is impacted by the world in which we live and how it is structured and the injustice in it. And, um, and it is a response to uh, our, our behaviors in this world. In the afterlife, however, or on the day of judgment, this is not going to be the case. And the, there will be a direct link between the life that we lived and the duties that we undertook and the responsibility that we accepted and the happiness that we have in the hereafter. So the passages that teach us about the sanction in the, sanction in the world to come are uh, divided in three main ways. One uh, is that the passages that state only um, that the eternal abode of the just or guilty is paradise or hell. Others express the destiny of individuals in an indeterminate way. Uh, so for the just is good news, hope, a fine promise, triumph, immense good. And that's quite subjective. Um, and, and I added some of the, a couple of the descriptions because they're very beautiful. People who have done good will be greeted by their own deeds, which will be even more enriched and which will be returned to them in full and multiplied according to the best of their actions with extra granted uh, by the grace of God. And then the, in the third instance, there's passages concerning the nature of uh, paradise and hell respectively and the transitory period in between. And if you haven't read the part on paradise, I suggest that you do. It's actually extremely uh, beautiful. Uh, inshallah, yani, um, nobody will really need to look at the other ones. It's good to know, but inshallah, not for us. May Allah forgive us our sins. So all of this is to say, and this is not the way that it is written in the book, but all of this is to say that we have to stay tuned to our attitude. And what the Quran tells us, as I said earlier, how it exhorts us, is through three, or well, there are four actually, but we're going to talk about three because the fourth is about people that reject faith and are quite nasty. So we're going to talk about the um, three that are possibilities for believers. So the first attitude is a clearly welcoming attitude, you know, favorable towards order and discipline. You approach um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, and the sunnah of the Prophet in a very loving framework. And for these people, for this kind of believer, um, the duty is how you sustain your life. It nourishes you. It raises your soul. You multiply the demands on yourself. It's not, you don't go for the minimum. You know, you're constantly looking for how do I improve uh, this obligation? How do I do it better? How do I make somebody happier? You know, we were commenting the other day on Facebook, how do I give somebody their dignity? How do I listen to who they really are? Um, not just people, but nature as well. You know, you can treat animals and plants and everything around you really uh, much better. So for the clearly welcoming attitude, what the Quran tells them, the commandments, the values, the objectives, just enter very beautifully. There's great reception. Uh, and, and that's the uh, first kind uh, or the highest kind of, of reader of the Quran. And it's the highest uh, character that the Quran exhorts or urges on forward to more mer meritorious acts. So uh, the Prophet, Ayat al-Salatu salam uh, um, said that constancy and continual progress were the very definition of perfection. He was asked, what is it to do good? And he replied, to do good is to obey God with the same presence of mind as if you were seeing him. And if you do not see him, surely he sees you. So those with a welcoming attitude live with that, even in their own selves. So even your thoughts, by the way, um, are, are subject to at least moral sanction. So, you know, when you have a bad thought and you say, oh, I shouldn't have thought that, and you say, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, you know, that is, even your thoughts are kept pure because you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, um, is ever present. The second attitude is still, it's generally well disposed, but it doesn't exclude the possibility of sin. And here the Quran gives commands in the abstract form, 
um, that don't directly stimulate, uh, you know, towards good, nor does it crush evil tendencies for this particular attitude. Um, this particular believer no longer sees, God sees everything you do, as in the previous case, but be careful not to do evil. Such is your duty, you know, God will see what you do, as opposed to God is constantly seeing what you do. So the decision for that kind of believer can kind of go either way. And this is the vast majority of people. And then we have the complacent attitude and not complacent, the other complacent, the complacent meaning pleasant. This is still a pleasant attitude. It's still a believer that's trying in principle, but they're swayed by circumstances in their life. So here, the formulations in the Quran become a bit stronger. There's more denunciation because there's greater potential on the part of that reader, that attitude to violate the law. And, and here, the, when the Quran approaches this kind of believer, it makes them just feel more modest. You know, they don't want to commit acts that would embarrass them in front of God. You know, it's kind of somewhere uh, in, in their minds. Uh, but also, they are, they're still, you know, in the range of good because they don't want to do wrong. And if, if and when they do, it's because uh, there were pressures in life that put them in that circumstance. So, to wrap up, um, the, inshallah, the two kinds of sanction that most of us will experience in our lives, hopefully, are moral and, and divine. Hopefully, we're not going to run into the legal sanction, unless it's something minor like a parking ticket or something like this. But most of us will be affected by the moral sanction, and we have to sensitize ourselves to this. This is extremely, extremely important um, in the moral theory of the Qur'an. You have to remain sensitive to what your inner voice is telling you. That feeling of, I feel bad, I didn't do the right thing, don't suppress it. You know, don't suppress it. Take that as the first step towards developing a new attitude, toward the first step towards restoring yourself to your original dignity. Always keep that alive. And the more you keep it alive, the more you're going to be sensitive towards uh, wrong that you might be doing, the more you can rectify, the more you're going to elevate yourself. So keep cognizant of your attitude. When you read the Quran, if you feel like the voice that is talking to you is the voice of the complacent attitude instead of the welcoming attitude, take measures to move yourself from uh, one attitude to the next. Ask yourself why. Be cognizant when you're reading the Quran of where, where it's talking to you. Where do you feel that the Quran is talking to you and where do you feel that it's not talking to you? So for instance, when I started reading the Quran, I, I, the parts about hell and, and punishment, they never spoke to me, ever. Like, I was never concerned by them when I read the Qur'an at all. So from the very beginning, I was cognizant of what the Qur'an, how it approached me, how it affected me. My attitude, of course, over time has, has changed. And to be cognizant of that um, is very important. So you can move yourself um, uh, upwards, inshallah, towards piety and greater and greater merit. So I think that's good. So we can open it to discussion before time is up, inshallah. And uh, hopefully there will be a lot of discussion because, uh, as I said, sanction is quite, quite a tough one. Jazakallah uh, khair, doctora. Thank you so much for catching up. Um, you know that the time is constrained. Um, and I won't take further uh, time anyhow. I'm just going to open it up for questions as well, too. If you have questions, go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, and just ask your question, or uh, you can type it in the uh, comment section, and I can read it out if you have any questions. Okay. Does somebody want to? No questions just yet. People Not are still trying to take it. <laughs> we understand. You can give us the exam now. There you go. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Um, Sorry. Okay. Um, I, I have a question. Um, so earlier in, in, uh, you, you, were, you were talking about, um, uh, you know, um, 
I'm really bad with words, but um, I was thinking about, um, what is it called? I'm sorry, I'm so bad with uh, summarizing, but like it was about, you know, forgiveness and, and the, you know, the measures that you have to take and basically what you have to do. Now, I guess my question is, um, like what, what supersedes what is Islamically speaking, like to, to, to give you an example of what I'm talking about. Um, you know, so we know that, um, if we recite, there's always like, there's always different avenues for forgiveness, um, in Islam. So if we recite, for instance, I could go to see, um, after every prayer, um, you know, the reward for that is that nothing will stop you from going to Jannah. Uh, you know, so it's, uh, it's, you know, for X, Y, and Z. So my question, I guess, is like, what supersedes what, or, or you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. um, do I have to do, uh, you know, like for instance, for, for ghaybah, like we talked about it last week, I have to do, um, I have to, to take, I have to do something in order for inshallah, hopefully to, to be forgiven. Or when you were saying earlier, you know, like you have to uh, really um, like ask Allah SWT to forgive you. I mean, there's, I mean, obviously I think if we sat and we, thought about every single action of ours that we that we did wrong i think it would that's what we'd be spending the rest of our lives doing but like what basically what supersedes what because the, i feel like we have different avenues to do you know to, for so many different things this time. i think of course that's from the mercy of allah but i guess yeah what what like what should the focus be on well it's a really good question and it's beautiful that i think you answered it in the end um, it is a mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that there are so many avenues to seek forgiveness. Ultimately, um, it is really to purify your heart, to really, as, as I said the, today, the repentance, to be truly repentant. And to be truly repentant is to, again, we said to desist immediately, to make reparations if you can, um, to give something um, to, you know, improve your manners and to participate in a better future. Um, so, which supersedes which, I really don't know because I don't think anybody can answer that. You might do one with extreme ikhlas, so uh, dedication and, and selflessness, and that'll be more than something else you did with less. So if somebody says to you, um, perhaps giving a huge sadaqah would do it. Yeah, but what if you gave that sadaqah and it was something about that, you know, was bothering you and you didn't do it with the purity of heart that you should have. Whereas if you read, like you said, Surat al-Mulk or Ayat al-Kursi and you're very, you know, um, focused and very pure in your intention and asking God, uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala, for forgiveness, that that might be in your scale heavier than it would be in someone else's. So, which supersedes which, we, we can't know. Nobody can tell you. I think they all go together. I think they complement each other. Uh, they're offered, obviously, for people with different capacities and capabilities. And really, there's, there's no limit. I mean, they complement each other. Keep at them. You can never fully know um, which is the one that will tip the scales. So keep at all of them, really. And no, nobody could really know that. Because nobody really knows the inside of you when you're doing these deeds or these acts or reading this Quran. You could be reading Ayat al-Kursi, but your mind is doing something totally different. So someone can't say to you, it's Ayat al-Kursi. You know? So whatever you do with purity, whatever you do with ikhlas, dedicated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, that will be accepted. And as we said in the last class, never lose hope. You know, Allah ghafurun rahim. Just think of Sayyidina Musa. Sayyidina Musa killed a man. You know, and he's a prophet. I'm not saying go and kill anybody. But, I mean, this is, this is huge in the Qur'an. It's a huge part of his life. And Rabbana subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you read the Qur'an, and God subhanAllah, he lists for him the things that he did for him up to the point where, you know, he says, and I, I purified you and I chose you for myself. It's beautiful. It'll bring tears to your eyes because he lived a very um, incredible life with a lot of events in it where we in our normal senses would think, you know, even he did, you know, thought, you know, he's going to end up being a prophet. So, you know, don't be too harsh on yourself, subhanAllah. If you have ikhlas, if you have purity of heart, if you're asking for forgiveness, if you're constantly improving yourself, inshallah, Allah ghafoon rahim. Inshallah. Any other questions? Um, so I have one, Dr. And it's um, a little reflection on the legal sanction. Uh-huh. And maybe 
the point of clarification that I wanted uh, from myself. So you said if the action is committed in public, yes. right? The, um, I guess the sanction has also been public. Mm. Then it's also good to forgive. So who gets to forgive? All the members of the public, one person who is in charge? How does that work? Mm. Uh, forgiveness um, doesn't enter uh, the public when, when there's a crime in the public. Forgiveness is something that the, the victim's family, for instance, or something like this, may wish to give. And the person themselves who committed the crime may repent sincerely. And so that's a moral, there will be a moral forgiveness with Rabbana subhanahu wa ta'ala, who knows the intent. But when something is in Islam, when something is perpetrated in public, the maqsid or the objective becomes protecting the public. So you cannot have somebody commit all of these crimes in public or any crime in public, a big one, one of the ones of Hadud, obviously, and then say, we forgive you, because that does not set the precedent that the Quran wishes to set. So the, the, to seduce people and to um, uh, spoil their, their faith is worse actually in Islam than the death penalty, for instance. And then I know this sounds harsh, but like I said, the point of Islam is to live a very moral life. You know, it's to draw your attention to our morality. When the, the fear is, which is what Islam, you know, tries to hedge against, is if we forgive something, um, you know, like, the, 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 for instance, the, the murder case right now in the U.S. that you advertised, uh, um, uh, Hamad? Yes, for instance. Okay, so what, the community comes out and they forgive the perpetrators? No, no, even if they repent, the, 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 the forgiveness is different. You can forgive, but they still have to be punished. They still have to be punished because that sets a precedent for the community. Or somebody, for instance, who, again, this is a very big problem in our communities with the um, lack of, uh, or the indiscretion when it comes to premarital intimate relations. You know, this is becoming rampant in our community. Why? It's becoming rampant because it, there's no response to it. You know, and, and it started off quiet and it started off in secret and now, you know, it's, it's not so anymore. And so when this happens in public and there is this boastful, then what do you end up with? You end up with a community that is morally decaying. And so to avoid that or to address that, Islam says if something comes to the public eye, then it has to be addressed. Even if the person repents, they repent, khalas, they can go to Ghana, you know. I also want to say one thing is very important, and because if you're thinking of the harshness of Islamic um, penalties, in the Quran, by the way, there is not the penalty, there's no, there isn't the death penalty for adultery. That does not, it's not in the Quran. This was from al Israelite pre-Islam, and it is not in Islam. So the stoning to death and things like this, that is not in, there is no stoning in the Quran. I just want to clarify that for people that think there's stone, there is no stoning. There's lashing, but there's no stoning. Thank you, Doctora. Thank you. It's, we have to sensitize ourselves again, Ajara. I think that's the thing. I think we have to sens sensitize ourselves to the higher moral order. We, we've lost that. You know, we've lost that, I think. And it's not about not having compassion. I, I made very, very clear that the hudud are extremely, extremely difficult to implement, by the way. Extreme, you must have been really um, explicit. I mean, explicit. We're talking, if we're talking, um, you know, intimate things, we're talking about four witnesses who actually witnessed the act itself. I mean, the act itself. So even two people under covers, you haven't witnessed it. You can't claim to have seen it. Can you imagine how strict that is? So in order for the penalty to be meted out, you have to have seen the actual act and you have four people, which means you're literally in the street and you're not covered. That's pretty intense. So they're more exemplary than they are really for um, application. And, and we, always, we have to keep that in mind. But again, it's to draw our attention to the higher moral 
um, aspect of Islam. Okay. All right. Dr. Um, any other questions? Uh, people here. I'm trying to look at uh, the notes I took as well to see. Uh, So do we understand how this is all fitting together while you're sitting there waiting? So are we understanding that this is what, this is the triangle. We start with obligation, okay? We start with our duties. The Quran informs us of our duties and it appeals to us in a number of ways. It either appeals to us through the value of the duty or it appeals to us through the nature of our belief or it appeals to us through consequence. And so we internalize these duties, we learn about them, and we make a conscious decision regarding them. This conscious decision goes one of two ways. Yes, I accept this duty. No, I don't accept this duty. If I accept a duty, I immediately bear responsibility. And then the sanction changes. So if I say no, I will be sanctioned for saying no if I am a believer and I'm supposed to undertake the duty. If I say yes, then the nature of the sanction changes. It comes from um, how well did I carry through this responsibility? So I accepted the responsibility. Now, did I fulfill it or did I fall short? And depending on this, then the law will react to my attitude. It will react to what I am doing or undertaking. And that moves us from responsibility to sanction. When I get to sanction, I have moral sanction. Moral sanction is, is what happens from within me. It's the inner voice that I have. That voice tells me, Vesma, you did this properly, you can be satisfied, or no, you can do it better next time, or you made a mistake, maybe you should repent, or you should repent. This is the moral side of um, sanction. Then I have the legal side, which again, I said most of us hopefully will never experience because that has to do with uh, the courts. This is the, the two that we spoke about in Islam or in um, just in your civil life. And the third kind is divine um, sanction. And there we have a number of different um, elements. We have material element where Rabbana subhanahu wa ta'ala will show us the benefits of our faith materially, or we will see the benefits through his protections in terms of the civic perspective, or we'll see it in terms of our intellectual raising of our value, or we'll see it in terms of, um, uh, or we'll see it in terms of our uh, feelings, that he loves us and we feel this love and we get this reward that we feel loved. So that's divine sanction. That's how the triangle uh, works with each other. Inshallah, next week, which is our wrap-up, we're going to be talking about um, how really do we move from um, the, 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 these different attitudes? How do we move in between them? Because we're going to be talking about intention, which is extremely interest, important for any act to be properly religious, if you don't have intention, it is not properly religious. Uh, and we're going to be talking about effort and two main types of effort in particular, inshallah, eliminatory effort and uh, ever more creative and meritorious effort. And that's how the entire picture fits together. So I hope that was useful. I'm kind of bringing it all in your head. For sure. <laughs> And that actually opened up another question. This, okay, Anya had a question. Go ahead, Anya. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much. Um, I guess it's, it's more as a, as a comment um, uh, than a question, or a question, but I guess it's, it's difficult to, I mean, I, I, I just guess it's difficult to answer. That is, um, we are living in a system that is completely unsupportive of of this kind of mechanism that we should um, 
that we should follow, we should embody, like, any sense of decencies, uh, I mean, this different legal codes, wherever we are, which are not, often not, um, not really in tune to these um, um, different worldview, I would say. So, um, yeah, like we, we're talking about the, you know, the, the, the uh, adultery and whatnot. We live like in the spaces that are filled with pornography and this. And so I'm just, I don't know even like how to, it's not a question. It's just this sense of, um, it's very difficult to, to um, tune yourself to and, and kind of find like consistency with oneself and the world that one is interacting or living in. I think that's an absolutely um, great comment uh, slash question. And there is an answer, alhamdulillah. Um, it, I agree with you 100%. The good news is that Islam came down at a time when all of this was rampant. It's almost like there is never in any society a moment where, um, where this is complete. Yes, some societies it's easier than others, but then there's going to be other problems, right? So my response to that is, and what I know about, and this is the public policy in Islam, which is actually from where, where I come, is that, alhamdulillah, Islam uh, and its moral code and its uh, code of sanctions is gradual. Islam has a law of gradualism. And what we have to do as Muslims in our lifetimes, each according to their interest and each according to their specialization, is to work on precisely the areas that you mentioned. So, for instance, you know, uh, there's rampant pornography. How can we deal with that? How can we get involved in programs that are fighting this, that are proving or demonstrating that this is bad for everybody, for all humanity, for women's dignity? Uh, how can we be part of women's organizations, perhaps, that uh, promote programs that help with addiction, that get children out of addiction, that put restrictions on the internet? There's a lot that we can do. Can it? Will it make a difference, to be honest? I don't know. Tomorrow I'm talking about tawakkul, and, and part of that is that you do your part. When we're talking about adultery, for instance, in society, the least we can do, I mean, even if we cannot go to the fullest extent of the um, Islamic sanctions, we can show disapproval. We can um, shun being lax. I mean, we, we, we can write statements and we can say we, we don't approve. We don't approve as a community. I don't approve as an individual. Um, and encourage others to do the same so that we're not also on top of everything. We're scared to show what this morality is. The beautiful thing about Islamic ethics and, and morality, ethics really, because morality, we know the difference between ethics and morality. So ethics is what justice demands. Morality is what the soul aspires to. Okay, so to be moral, your soul has to aspire to God and only God. But ethics is a question of justice, and we can do it for different reasons. We can have different moral reasons for wanting to be ethical. So the beauty of Islam, and I just answered this question recently. Someone had given an answer that I didn't find was satisfactory is that they said, for instance, they were talking about, um, they were talking about zina, I think, actually. Um, and, and they said, but this is religious. And it, it, was, it was explained to them that, uh, okay, you know, um, this is on the religious side, but on the secular side, and it is a confusing answer. And I said, you're not understanding how the ethical system of the Quran works. When the Quran is against zina, it speaking to humanity is not just a something religious. It is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his knowledge of how the entire system works knows that this particular moral rule is the one that would enable humans to flourish. 
whether or not you're Muslim. It doesn't matter. Now, you can practice, you know, uh, purity and abstinence because your morality is because you're Muslim, because you, you, you have Allah as your ultimate goal. Or you can do it because you know that this is the way that strong societies function. And there are actually now longitudinal studies that demonstrate this, that societies that are um, sexually pure, intimately pure, that are um, monogamous in their relationships, where their marriages last and they have families, they are civilizations that last longer than those that are, uh, have all this mess. So the beautiful thing about the Qur'an and when you're told that this is religious and we're secular, you say, no, this is not the way the Qur'an works. The rules in the Qur'an are only, as we're going to talk in our last session, they're only properly religious through intention. Otherwise, the rules set down in the Qur'an for humanity are because that can allow us to reap the benefits of who we are as humans, can allow us to live the best life. And so it is not secular or religious. This is something that would also work in a secular world. So we can defend Islamic principles in different fora uh, that way. And we can do it piecemeal. You know, we can encourage piecemeal what we can, what we're interested in, inshallah. And, and may Allah give us strength. But there is a way to address that um, on a very gradual piecemeal basis, inshallah. And if we all do it, hopefully, you know, one person with the next and with our naya and with what we how we want to see the world evolve, inshallah, we can create a critical mass of these impacts and these studies that actually show that, you know, it's not about being religious. This is what works for humanity. I hope that was useful. Yes. <laughs> Just like, you know, Thank you, Anya, for the question. Do we have any other questions? Um, Okay. No hands up. We have about 10 minutes. I have a following thought, though, to Anya's question, and I don't know that this is something that we can answer. Because um, I'm thinking of a lot of scenarios in my head, um, and I don't even know, but to what extent um, are we able to um, do what Anya is saying? So, for example, we live in these societies that are quote unquote immoral, right? I mean, that have all these vices that are mentioned. Mm -hmm. And, for example, you don't, uh, you know, you, you try to speak up against it, whether, with, whether it's with your money, what you patronize, what you buy, what you don't buy, you write letters, petitions, you do. Mm -hmm. What is it? Is there a limit to how much you can um, stand up against those vices? So, for example, and I'm going to use a very extreme example that I've heard before, right? So the roads that you drive on are built with river money and, you know, the things that you buy and the stores all have explicit, you know, all this, every store you go to, to buy even, you know, halal, even the so-called, you know, places where you can buy nice clothes, right? They have supermodels advertising those clothes, you know, and, and bikinis and whatever that they're wearing. What do you do? Do you start sewing clothes on your own, you know, at home? What, what do you do? I mean, I, I, I'm being silly here, but the no, point no, is... No what extent do you, you know, do you, do you limit yourself to be able to stand up against these vices, at least to, to, you know, to the extent possible in your life? I, to, be, to be reasonable with yourself, and, and again, um, to be reasonable with yourself, you, you do to your capacity. As we said on, on you know, in our first session, um, the morality in the Quran or the rules, the duties are gentle. It only asks you to go as far as you can. So as far as you can means exactly the system in which you live, a system of riba, for instance. What can you do if the global system is like this? Um, I'll, I'll give you my, my own example. For instance, it's a personal example. But when I came to buy homes in Canada and to, to get a mortgage, because obviously you can't pay it off, or you're going to end up renting for most of your life and giving somebody else your wealth, basically making somebody else wealthy, and the Muslims are going to end up being impoverished. This is just the way it is with that, with that mentality. But I did a naya. You know, and my nail is, God, I'm not going to spend on anything frivolous until I've paid off this house because I'm against the, uh, the concept of interest. Alhamdulillah, 
uh, the discipline paid off and, and I was able to do that. Alhamdulillah, my damir or my, my conscience is at rest because it's not like I can, it's not like there's other options. There aren't other options. To keep the ummah impoverished is not an option, you know. But when I see people that take out mortgages and then they go on vacations and then they have massive this and massive that and they're not actually taking seriously um, the, the prohibition against interest by prioritizing its payment, then there's an issue. Uh, with with the stores and things like this, I will say, you know, look down. I mean, don't, don't don't look at things that will harm your eyes. Subhanallah. And with time, you'll get accustomed to not looking. You won't you won't see these things anymore. You go in for your gharad, for your uh, objective. You know, you want to buy a tarha, or you want to <clears throat> buy a sweater. Do your thing and and go. Can we avoid all of the harams in the world? No. The, the reality is no. But this is where again the law is gentle. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what's in our hearts and he knows the world in which we live. And like I said, we don't, let's not romanticize the past. I don't think there was ever a time. I mean, riba has been around since way. We would not have come in the Quran if there wasn't riba. This is the system even when the Quran came down. I mean, pornography even then, you know, zina even then. All of the big things that, you know, we think today are rampant must have been rampant then because they actually have a place in the Quran. So we have to keep that in mind and appreciate subhanahu wa ta'ala, appreciate the beauty that he gave us in, in making it gentle and in giving us as humanity, all of us as individuals, different interests. You know, and he says in the Quran, you have different interests, you tend towards different um, objectives. And in giving us that ability, he allowed us to intervene, you know, to make these contributions in the world that will hopefully make a difference and if they don't make a difference, we talked about divine sanction today, inshallah, even if we don't see it for dunya, we inshallah will definitely see it um, on the day of judgment, and we'll hopefully be rewarded for everything that we tried to do. So never lose hope. You know, never be so cynical that you don't do anything. Because there is so much to do. You know, there is so much to do um, in, in all of these things. And we live in a world where there's so many organizations that are actually looking at the negative impacts of gambling, of alcohol, of pornography, of uh, computer addictions for kids and gaming addictions, um, even of, of the problem with, you know, of debt, debt for, for countries and debt for individuals. There's so much that we can do, you know, still at t to show that we are sincere. And we should take advantage of that, you know, in, w in one way or another. Because we can, we can make a difference. I firmly believe that. Jazakallah khair, Doctor. Thank you so much. Um, I don't have any questions further. We're about uh, time. Does anybody have any um, burning questions before we pass it to the doctor to close the session? Okay, Selma had something. Selma, go ahead. Yes. I think we can. Can you hear me? Sorry about that. Um, I just wanted to uh, ask a quick question regarding the um, statement Dr. Basman just made regarding. Um, Muslims being impoverished. Can you elaborate a little bit on that issue of, um, you know, dealing with, um, you know, riba, whether to avoid, whether to not? Um, I just kind of wanted to hear your opinion or your. Um, um, I gave my life experience. Yeah, I, mean, my, I gave my own life's experience because, of course, there's so many volumes, fatawa, written on this um, by, by people. And there's different opinions. If you're going to talk fatwa, not me, I'm not giving fatwa. I'm just simply saying there's different fatwas. There is, of course, the fatwa that any riba is haram and the only thing that a person can do is rent, right? And then, though, there's a group of scholars that uh, thought about it and thought, well, if all of the Muslims are going to be renting, then we're never going to own property. And we will be impoverished because you're never going to be the owner of the property. So you spend about 20 years of your life or 25 years of your life. You've, if you're paying about two, $3,000 a month, you know, calculate that over 25 years. That's an inheritance you could have left for your kids. You know, so th they said, okay, then there is this exception because, because of just the world in which we live. But m my addition was in, you don't take it as an exception and then you live life as normal. If you're going to take it as an exception, you do your absolute best to pay off that mortgage, which means that live according to your means, within your means. You know, don't go mortgage a house for a million dollars if all you have is 
200,000, 200,000. If that can buy you a home without interest, do the 200,000. Save money, buy a home for 400,000, whatever. But don't go over to the point where it is frivolous, it is not needed, and you do not have the capacity to pay it off. Um, the, the impoverished part came from this, like I said, I feel very sad when I see Muslims stuck in that. And, and I've seen you know, math, crazy mathematical calculations of how much is spent on rent when they can buy. I'm not saying, I'm, I'm saying they have the down payment, they have the jobs, they have the stability. So they can purchase a home and in paying the mortgage, you know, you're, they're actually owning something and building wealth in this ummah for this ummah. So this is my, my take on it. I go with the second fatwa, but with the qualification that when you do this, you uh, discipline yourself to pay it off like within the term that you agree to. So if I tell a bank I could do this in five years, alhamdulillah, you do it within five years. If you do it within 10, then you do it within 10. Um, but you stick to that. So you don't do other luxurious things or optional things in the middle. And you do it with that niyyah and you pray to God to help you pay it off. And that is definitely not your intention to be paying it, but that's for sure. That's what I meant. And there's fatawa out there for everything I just said, by the way. There's this way and that way. Thank you so much. That was very, um, I think a lot of, a lot of people here, at least I um, benefited from that clarification for sure. So thank you Salma for asking that question. Um, thank you so much. Um, so we'll just uh, send it back to you for some closing thoughts and a dua. And then inshallah, we'll adjourn until next week, inshallah. Well, alhamdulillah, you know, I think I, I did the summation of the, you know, the, the bigger picture. I look forward to, inshallah, next week. I really do want to thank everybody again for being a part of this and for permitting me to share this with you. Uh, this, again, I will say, as I said the first day, this particular work weighs very heavily on me because I think that so many Muslims um, don't fully grasp how the Quran presents them with the duties that they are responsible for how they must take responsibility for those duties if they're claiming to be Muslim, uh, and how Rabbana subhanahu wa ta'ala, out of his mercy, gave us this internal mechanism that can continually allow us to self-improve so that we can avoid both the legal sanction and, inshallah, the negative side of the divine sanction in this world and the world to come. So the importance of this work and understanding um, of morality for every Muslim, uh, I cannot say enough about, and, and I thank you for allowing me that privilege. So I say that, inshallah, and uh, we can do dua, I suppose. Yeah. رب يوزاني أن أشكر نعمتك التي أنعمت علي وعلى ولدي وأنا عم صالحة الله وأصلح لي في زوريتي إني تبت إليك وإني من المسلمين إني تبت إليك وإني من المسلمين إني تبت إليك وإني من المسلمين اللهم بلغنا شهر رمضان المبارك وتقبل أحسن أعمالنا وعف عنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا وادخلنا في السلم كافة اللهم ادخلنا في السلم كافة اللهم ادخلنا في السلم كافة يا رب اللهم جمعنا أينما كنا على الصدق والسلام والتقوى وعف عنا أرحم الراحمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك صلاتك الكاملة الأزلية الأبدية على سيدنا محمد اللهم احشرنا في زمرته يا رب اللهم اجعلنا من لها ينظر الوجهك الكريم يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم ضللنا بظلك يوم لا ظل غير ظلك يا رب وجعل يوم القيامة علينا هين يا رب وادخلنا جناتك بغير حساب اللهم ادخلنا الجنة بغير حساب اللهم ادخلنا الجنة بغير حساب وصلى الله على الحبيب الأمين المصطفى سيدنا محمد وعلى أهله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين أقول قولي هذا واستغفر لي ولكم آمين آمين بزاكم الله فارك Thank you so much I ask God to throw us all in heaven without any account All together آمين يا رب I mean, oh, yeah. Allah, there is nothing too great for him. This is true. This is true. Alhamdulillah. Thank you, Doctor. I really for your time as always, for your love and your kindness. Thank you so much.
And may Allah, may Allah bless you. May Allah um, grant you what is good, inshallah, and, and open mm. your heart, give you light, and all of us, inshallah. Mm. And um, enjoy, and we'll see everyone next time, bi And Salaam. sorry for the good thing, inshallah. Next week, we hope that things are better. Bi-idhnillah. Alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.